We're delighted to have you along with us and delighted to say the football writer Daniel Harris joins us on the line. Good morning, Daniel. Hiya. Five days after, obviously, the event, I've never known a penalty shootout reaction that's had such little focus on the shootout. How is everybody? Is there a collective, cathartic uh, movement happening over there? Uh, not really. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it doesn't seem... I think that most people were quite pleased with how the team did. And so I think it's also hard to argue that Italy weren't the, weren't the best team in the competition also. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just the people I know. Most people have kind of looked at it quite sensibly. And because what happened afterwards was what everyone knew was going to happen afterwards, is you're kind of sitting there watching the players that are going up to take the penalties and watching the players that missed the penalties. I was going to say in the back of your mind, but it's not the back of your mind, the forefront of your mind. You feel like you know what's happening. Mm. So, and what's going to happen if they miss. So it feels like the reaction to the missed penalties overtook very much discussion of the penalties. And that's even before you factor in what sounds quite chaotic experience at Wembley. The reaction to it, I think, is going to be, um, as it plays out continually and, and as the players themselves continue to come out and obviously speak about it very eloquently, does the... I wonder about the open nature of the conversation, Daniel, off the back of it, as to whether it... I mentioned a sort of collective catharsis, catharsis maybe off the back of it but is there a chance that it in another way deepens divides in that like it's easy for people to sort of maybe further express deeply held and um, at times very weird uh, opinions about this stuff is there a chance that it, it ends up deepening divides rather than being any kind of a um, healing process uh, I, I think that football is a product of, of the divides rather than something that necessarily inspires it. So I think that what we saw is a reflection of the divides that already exist. So it might exacerbate them in the moment, but I doubt that any new race, racists or anti-racists were created as a result of what, what happened in, in the penalty shootout. I think it just gives people an excuse to voice the sentiments that's already there and let's be real the kind of sentiments that have been legitimised by successive Tory governments. This isn't something that just happened in a vacuum. It happened because we've seen racism from David Cameron. We've seen racism from Theresa May. We've seen racism from Boris Johnson. We've seen racism from the entirety of the Tory party, more or less. As a, not obviously every single individual within it, but all those people, there are, the leaders within it have been publicly racist more than once. And the people that voted for them and the people that remained members of that party are tacitly accepting the fact that it's acceptable. So it's not that these, these divides exist, then they were created and milked for political gain. And what happens on a football pitch is only going to encourage people to voice what was already there. It's not turning people who weren't racist, as I said, it's not turning people who weren't racist into racists. And it's not turning people... It's not turning people into anti-racists either, because anyone who understands the importance of anti-racism, I'm sure, was there already. I mean, perhaps not. It would be, in some ways, like, nice isn't the right word, but it would be better if some people... It, it would be good if some people had seen the response of this precise thing and football's ability to talk to everyone had opened people's eyes. But I think at this point in human history, if your eyes aren't open at this point, it's because you're closing them on purpose. Mm. Definitely doesn't feel like a moment of like education or learning for a lot of people other than like maybe, as I said, maybe deepening those divides. On the, on the political side uh, and the reaction to it, and Gary Neville gave great voice to it in, in uh, the following day after the, after the game, um, you've mentioned a, a litany of political leaders that have, have uh, had unusual rhetoric uh, over the last while. It might suggest that there's, there, is there a kickback, a political kickback, an election, uh, election kickback from, from that sort of stuff, Daniel, or is it just is that business as usual? Um, we're just, we're so, we're so little time into the electoral term and at some point we're going to get the bounce of everyone being able to go about their business again after Corona that I, I don't think it's going to make a lot of difference. Mm. Uh, because, and I think very specifically with Boris Johnson, one of the problems with getting Boris Johnson out for people that care about competent government and, and morality is that all this stuff was baked in from the beginning. When people voted for Boris Johnson, lots of people, not all the people, but probably most of the people knew what Boris Johnson was because he hadn't, he'd never hidden it. So when all the things happened that you know about already, 
Well, most people already made their peace with that when they voted for him, if they even had to make peace with it in the first place. So it feels slightly different that when you have, as it is now, when you have a government that goes in and preaches morality. So the, the last Labour government, Tony Blair's Labour government, came in at the end of a period of sleaze. And what you'd had was, you had John Major talking about this back to basics campaign and good old fashioned family values, or well, what, what the Tory party can considered to be family values at the time. And then you've got MP after MP getting caught performing all sorts of adulteries and also slightly unusual sexual proclivities. And because it went together with this Back to Basics campaign, it became, I think that was one of the main reasons it became a thing. I guess public morality was slightly different at that point as well. Like people, like conventions worked. So if if a minister if a minister got, if a minister's department got into trouble, then the minister would resign, and that was kind of one of the ways that Britain's unwritten constitution was preserved by keep people abiding by conventions. They don't do that anymore, and no one cares about them either. Like the politicians don't care about them, and the public don't care about them, and the press don't really care about them that much either. So it's hard to see for that reason and for the reason that all this stuff is already baked into Boris Johnson's premiership and something that people knew they were voting for in the first place, that this will necessarily have any electoral repercussion. And we're only, what, year and a half into, I was going to say a five-year electoral term, but that's no longer the case. They got rid of the fixed fixed term elections, or they are getting rid of one or two. I think, it, I think it's gone, of the, of the fixed parliamentary term election act. So... It's hard to see. It's really, I mean, and I don't, I say this with an extreme amount of upset that for all these reasons and what sort of happened in Britain over the last probably five to 10 years, I think. And I heard this anecdotally from someone and then I actually saw some data from The Economist about it is what's happened is you had in what they used to call the Red Wall, where people, well, working class people who were his parents had been miners or factory workers mainly or whatever, that kind of thing, voted Labour without even thinking about it. Mm. Then Brexit created this big fissure because it sort of just, Labour really struggled to start to keep together its electoral coalition of people who may have been, who may or may not have been socially conservative, but were, whose parents were Labour. But I think the big fissure has come because the children of those working people don't are not are not don't consider themselves to be working class. They're earning enough money in office jobs and that kind of thing to afford a house, to afford a car or two, to afford a few holidays. So, although the Tory government despise those people, um, they don't see it like that, and they see their lives as quite going quite well. So, when you're trying to campaign for change or devise a political narrative that will talk about the need for change. If you're people who don't really see the need for change and they see themselves as people for whom the system is working, then it's hard to convince those people not to not to vote for what perpetuates the system that they know to be working. And that is a problem, and it's looking at the moment like an intractable problem of the English left, because if you consider the fact that post-war, James Callaghan won the election for Labour, but the only other person to win those elections was Tony Blair. And Tony Blair won election in a, in a very, very specific set of circumstances. He had the end, of, he won in 1997, and he'd had 18 years of Tory rule, so that's one. Then the other thing is the Tory party was tearing itself apart over Europe, two. Three, that Back to Basics campaign and sleaze that I talked about, four. A massive recession, five. And a leader of, I mean, whatever else you say about Tony Blair, and I'm not legitimising his position on Iraq or any of the rest of it, you've got a leader of undeniable charisma. And all of those things needed to coalesce for Labour to win an election. And doesn't look like those things are coalescing again, which makes it a massive problem, which means that the future of this country is, on the one hand, we can see that the racist right is losing the demographic battle. And we see it in America as well, but we're a bit further away from than America are from that demographic, that demographic battle being the single deciding nature of an election. So we can all look at this football team and see how they represent the true makeup of the UK, but it's not going to be reflected in the ballot box quite yet, I don't think. Yeah, it'll be uh, a little while, obviously, before well, that happens. state of affairs. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been it's been quite the week. I mean, we, we wanted to get you on to... to 
to talk Manchester United as well. Daniel, are, are you enjoying this beautiful distraction of saying that the team viewer jersey is crap and I uh, wonder how Jaden Sancho is going to fit in on the right hand side? Are you ready for this, basically, is what I'm saying? What I most enjoyed was um, the, uh, there was the poet of Manchester, David Scott, um, when uh, he saw there was a picture of Donny van der Beek in the team viewer T-shirt, and he said, "Why has he got his name on the front of the shirt?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's actually as far as shirts go. I mean, I'm 42, find it quite hard to get that excited about football <laughs> shirts, or at least the ones I don't like. I quite, I quite like this shirt. It's really hard to see from the photos if it's the correct shade of red, but um, the white sleeves are nice. Um, so. I think as far as United go, um, it's, I mean, you, it's an interesting situation for them because they look like they might get the signings that will remove the excuses. And so like, if they get Sancho, it looks like Varane's going to happen. If they get a midfield player as well, then they are in a position to actually do something this season. And they'll be a little bit short at the beginning of the season, as I imagine a lot of teams will. I'm not sure who's going to make the first few games. Obviously, Marcus Rashford isn't which I think is a good thing because if you imagine when he comes back, when he's, he's not been fit for two years, when he comes back and he's sorted out his shoulder, he's sorted out his ankle, he's had a physical rest, he's had a mental rest, and he's aggravated about what happened uh, um, in the Euros, then you're going, to see, you're going to see a beast, I think. And he's also going to have to win his place in the team because Jaden Sancho and Mason Greenwood are more than able deputies or players that could take his place away from him. So I think... For United, what they've got, and as a United supporter, what I really wanted was I wanted them to have a good start, a start where you felt like they could get on a roll. Because often, it's not always the case, but often when a team is trying to challenge for the title and they haven't for a bit, um, we saw it with United when they hadn't got anywhere near the league really in 04, 05, 06, and then 05, 06. They started off with, I think, Fulham up at home and Charlton away in 06, 07. They smashed them both. And then, then you start to get some momentum. I remember it happening with Liverpool as well. They had, a really, they had quite a friendly start in 08-09 and they, found, they wound up producing a title challenge that no one really foresaw. So I think that United are definitely, definitely going to be stronger than they were last season. And where I think, I'd hope that Jaden Sancho would make the difference is I can't remember exactly what the stats were, but I think United may have won only nine home league games last season. And that's where, that's where the league was lost. Mm -hmm. And I think that having Jaden Sancho able to stretch the pitch on the right, able to attack defences, another playmaker, or just giving you another option off the bench, whether he's the one on the bench or one of the other wide players is on the bench, will make quite a big difference in those games. The question is whether United can continue winning as many away games as they did, because that looked more like a freak. So maybe it will just balance out that with a few more home games, a few fewer away games, that wouldn't be enough for the title. But if they get Varane and then they get that midfield player, then they're really in with a chance, in theory. Uh, on Varane and on the possibility of Kieran Trippier, how confident and how potentially satisfied are you about those two moves? Uh, I think Varane's going to happen. Um, I tweeted about it quite a long time ago now when just what I had heard made me think that that was a deal that was going to be done because ultimately Real Madrid needed to sell United need, wanted to buy him and he wasn't going to be that expensive and the player wanted to leave. So those those three things coalesce and you would think that's likely to happen. Trippier, I'm not sure about. I mean, I saw Neil Custis from The Sun said, using the great fabled transfer double swoop headline, talked about that both those deals were close to completion. Uh, Neil Custis has been on the Manchester beat for a long time. He's not making it up. Doesn't mean it'll happen because obviously sometimes you get misinformed and lots of things have to happen sometimes before a transfer. But yeah, I think Trippier, Trippier would be a good deal for United in theory. He'd be a good deal for United because he'd give them a more attacking option instead of Aaron Wan-Bissaka, which is good. He can cover on both sides, which actually means you can start thinking about selling Diogo Dallo, Brandon Williams, maybe even Alex Tellez because you've got Trippier to, who can give you cover. And also he's a good age in that he's at his physical peak now. He knows he is the player that he is. He doesn't... He understands how to defend. He understands the game. He understands his body. And United have got Ethan Laird behind him. So what that would be is you give Trippier to say a two, or two to the three to four year contract. Ethan Laird goes out on loan this season. He has a Premier League loan next season. And then as Trippier's coming to the end of his contract, you've got Ethan Laird who looks like he might go on to be better than both him and Juan Bissaka. So in that aspect, it's a really good buy. It's less of a good buy, I guess, if. Because obviously you don't want that attacking option going forward down the right and down the left. I think Luke Shaw is a slightly less 
less good option if it means because of it you can't buy a midfield player. And I wouldn't mm. be diverting, let's say, 20 million quid towards Kieran Trippier if if I if I if I stop United from buying the midfield player that they need. But if if they were able to buy Varane, Trippier, and Sancho with the budget. They ought really to be able to raise what they need for a midfield player with sales because um, Brandon Williams might go, Dallow might go, as I mentioned, Jesse Lingard might go. I think they'd probably sell Anthony Martial if they got a good offer for him as well. So at that point, you start to be adding together the money, maybe also the goalkeeper, and then you should have enough for the midfield player too. If they do get both of those players, what's the what does that United defence look like? Uh, I think it, I think it depends. Um, I think what you'd see is if the, you'd see Varane and Maguire start almost every game. Lindelof is a really good number three. You might then see Eric Bailly leave, um, which I think would be fair enough for all parties. He's had enough chances and he's not stayed fit. But also when he has stayed fit, he also hasn't been reliable enough. Um, I think Axel Turnzebi might go. Might take. I think they might take a Premier League loan for him, and then see how that were to go. If he were to get a Premier League loan and if that were to, and if he were to go and do well, then he put himself in with a good chance of being the third choice. And then in say two years when Varane's 30, 31, then you might start thinking about in, uh, integrating him as a first choice. But if someone said he's 30 million pounds for two and Zebby, I think they'd probably take that as well. But you see, I think what you see is Varane and Maguire start almost every game. Then um, Luke Shaw would start most of the games. And then on the right, if, if they were to get Trippier, you'd see Juan Bissaka probably start all the big away games, a lot of the big home games. And then the games that United were struggling to win last season. So if I'm right, they won nine out of 20, nine out of uh, 18 home games. The other nine, for those kind of games that United weren't winning, you'd be seeing Trippier start. And then the rest of it would just kind of depend on the precise opponent or on who was injured. But yeah, I still think you'd see... Um, Pretty similar back four to last season, except one Bissaka and Trippy would do something of a job share. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'm not sorry. I'm talking nonsense at this point. It wouldn't be the same at all because uh, Ferran would be replacing Lindelof. You know what I mean? Yeah, job shares. It's what's listen. It's it's the front of the jersey. It's 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 the club philosophy now. What? Um, it's very far out, and there's plenty of moving parts. There's uh, Chelsea spending. There's possibly Kane to City, and possibly not. So loads of moving parts. But given those couple of moves and what's happening elsewhere what's your levels of confidence about United's ability to challenge when we eventually get back into it in about four weeks I think I never think I would never think too much about what the other teams are going to do it's what United do and whether I think they can get enough points to win the title um, I think that if they don't get a midfield player they are capable of still winning the title because I mean we've seen it done before with Fergie teams towards the end where he basically had a good attack and a good defence and not enough in midfield and it wasn't good enough for the Champions League but it was good enough to win the Premier League obviously that team had Fergie but so it's a little bit different but this team assuming Varane arrives there's going to be a good defence and there's going to be loads of goals that is enough to win the Premier League um, whether there's quite enough to control enough games you're, with, with the team as it is without a midfield player you're sort of taking a risk in the big games that the defenders will defend well and the forwards will find you a goal because let's say the midfield is, for argument's sake, McTominay, Pogba and Bruno or even in the big games, McTominay, Fred and Bruno, there probably isn't enough in there to either control the game or set a tempo of a game. And so when that's the case, you would think that you wouldn't get quite enough big game points to win the league or to win Champions League but with the defence that United look like they're going to have and the and the attackers they're going to have, there's more than enough to win every game, so it, it is possible. But with the right midfield player, whether I don't think it will be Declan Rice. I can't imagine United are going to buy Varane and um, and Trippi, uh, Varane and uh, Sancho and maybe Trippier and have enough money then to spend it on Rice. But I've said this a lot that I'm absolutely certain that I'm sure United. One of the reasons Rice is Rice is um, enticing is because. He plays in England. Um, you've seen a lot of him. He's the right kind of character. You know exactly what you're going to get. I'm absolutely certain there's a better player than Rice that you could get for half. But whether you would choose to pursue that, but I think that if United do get a midfield player at this point, that's what it would have to be. And then there's probably more risk, but perhaps more potential upside as well, whether it's uh, Camavinga or someone else, that you might even get a better player than Rice. So if United were to get a midfield player and it were to be the right midfield player, then there's absolutely no excuses. They'd have everything that they need to win the title. And then then whether they do or they don't will either be because Ole hasn't managed them well enough or the players haven't played well enough or combination of both. But 
if they were to get that player, then they would have a real hit at the title, I think. But the bar's going to be high. I mean, if you've got, if City have the most money, the best or the second best manager, and they sign Harry Kane, then that's a big problem for everyone. And if United were to not win the title from there, then, you know, it may be just because other teams had more of everything. So they are they are set for a good season, but I think a good start, I mean, it sounds like a ludicrous thing to say, of course, a good start is important, but a good start is important. And they haven't had that the last two years and they ended up finishing second. But if they, and you actually saw it with Pochettino, a couple of the times Pochettino went for the title, the one against Chelsea and the one, the one against Leicester and the one against Chelsea. Spurs were brilliant from about November, December, wherever it was, but they lost the title because they didn't start well enough. And I think that this, in some ways, is what Jose Mourinho brought to the English game. That Fergie always used to say, "Oh, we don't, oh, we don't start get going until after Christmas in the new year," like it was some lovable quirk taking off half the year. Mm. But then Mourinho turned up, and I think Mourinho's first game as manager of Chelsea was United at home. Um, they won one nil the penalty maybe against a terrible United team because United were kind of in between teams and they had injuries. But anyway, they won that first game against United 1-0. And from then on, you could not take half the season off and win the Premier League title. And that's what United will need to do. They need to start properly and they need to keep at it because it will be probably quite a lot of points winning the league this season because City will get a lot of points because they've settled this new team and they might sign Harry Kane. Um, Liverpool are going to be much better again. Chelsea haven't, are going to sign a striker, at least one striker. And if they get a good striker, that's going to make a phenomenal amount of difference. They're going to have all year of Tuchel and a pre-season with Tuchel. So it's going to be it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. And my one worry about this Premier League season is that we end up seeing too many points at the top end again. We don't want to see teams winning the league with 95 plus points. We want sort of 85 to 90-ish because yeah. you want the teams below that to be putting on a challenge on a weekly basis. So hopefully that's what we're going to see. Um, but yeah, it may well be that the teams at the top end up getting a silly amount of points again. Yeah, I suspect you wouldn't mind if it was United, mind you. But <laughs> um, Well, no, look, I want United to win the league, but I'm not... Number one, if you ask me which league titles as a United supporter I've enjoyed more, it's quite an easy answer, really. Like 93, 96, 99, 03, 07 and 13. And what yeah. they have in common, they all have other features in common as well. Like obviously, 13 was the last year of Fergie, and they won it early. So the run-in was just a conce- like just successive parties after parties, and it was a lot of fun. But the thing that all those years have in common is it comes after the year you've lost the title. And I think that's important, that you don't want a team winning all the time, because it's not entertaining it's not enjoyable there's no sense of jeopardy yeah you want you want you want it to be close you want to win tight title races it's you want you want teams not to win the same title every year you want teams not to win every week and similarly like i can sit here and say as i sometimes do that Roman Bramovic should never have been allowed near english football and, and um shake shake nyan um shake shake um the shake Mohammed should never have been allowed anywhere near english football but if they hadn't have been allowed near English football, could United have won basically every league title from 20, 2007 to 2013? Like, that's possible, and we don't want that either. And so we, you should, there's a difference between wanting your team to win and wanting it to mean something when your team wins. And the way it means something when your team wins is by jeopardy and competition. So uh, United running away with the league title is obviously like sounds like a good thing in theory, but it's not something definitely that you want to see on a regular. No. All right, Daniel, thanks, William. All right, guys. See you again. Have a good day, everyone. Have a good weekend.